Dr. Mark A. Smith is president of Columbia International University, a growing university in South Carolina. He previously served as president of Ohio Christian University for 12 years, where he led a team of experts in growing the university from 380 to more than 4,700 students and helped fund $30 million in facilities. Dr. Smith has committed his life to the advancement of the gospel through Christian higher education and preparing a new generation of ministers, missionaries, and ministering professionals for the day we live in. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Mark A. Smith. Good morning. We are so excited about this day and we have a large number watching online as well. But you are going to be honored guests today. One of the visions that God has placed in my heart and in Dr. Andre's heart is that we begin to pour back into uh, those in ministry. And uh, you are those today that are going to be honored. This idea really came from my good friend, Gerald Brooks. Pastor Gerald Brooks, would you stand just a moment? Dr. Brooks is with us from Dallas, Texas today, Plano, Texas. And Dr. Brooks uh, ministers every year all across the country uh, to pastors. He's a pastor's pastor, and we're thrilled to have him as well. But let me start out by saying this today. Dr. Andre Rogers took this as a seed thought after we attended Dr. Brooks's leadership conference for ministers. And today you will see the result of his hard work and the team around him. So Dr. Andre Rogers, we thank you for all you have done. The topic assigned by Dr. Andre uh, for me was to talk about growth. You saw in the last few years that God has allowed me, in the last 25 years, has allowed me the opportunity to serve in the kingdom to grow organizations. Uh, I've studied extensively on growth, on marketing. I've studied extensively on uh, organizational culture and how to move forward in those, those uh, organizations. One of the things I was privileged to do was serve at a school called Indiana Wesleyan University where as vice president we led an institution, a college, a university from about 2,500 students to 10,000. And I was vice president at that time and the president said you're an entrepreneur I want you to move forward with growth. Later, with the presidency, you saw what happened at Ohio Christian. And here at CIU, the Board of Trustees brought me in to say, let's grow the organization. And so we have grown here in the last three years, those of you who are not familiar, just a little update, we have grown from about 1,065 students. This year, we are at about 2,200 students. And so we've had tremendous growth here in the last three years. So Dr. Andre came to me and said, you've been a minister, you've been a pastor, you've led organizations that focus on growth for pastors. Would you talk to us about growth, growth in the organization? So I shared with him I would. Now I told him right off, I said, Dr. Andre, I said, I uh, really can't talk about for-profit organizations. Uh, I'm not a prophet, I said to him. You know, in fact, I've worked my whole entire life in nonprofit organizations. You're not awake yet, are you? Okay. I have to get some humor going. You'll find out Gerald Brooks. I'm warming you up for Gerald Brooks. He has a very dry sense of humor that will crack you up. So, Gerald, I'm giving him a warm up here. Uh, so, uh, today, let's, let's get started here. I want to start this time with you first by giving you a working definition of leadership, a working definition of leadership. Dr. Dr. Larry and Lindsay and myself have written numerous books. We've done about six or seven now. And one of those books is called Leading Change in Organizations, Leading Change in Your World. And as we studied different corporate and nonprofit 
and ministry organizations, we found out something that most people do not understand about leadership. And it's this. Leadership is about growth, forward movement. Management is about repetitive action. You've heard the old saying that if you want to do what you've always done, you can expect to get what? The same results. Really, that comes from Max Weber's bureaucratic model. And Max Weber studied many organizations for the Industrial Revolution. And in studying those Industrial Revolution organizations, he would take a moment and those time studies would show the most efficient way to get something done. Let me give you an example. I worked at Haynes Knitwear in my junior and senior year of high school and my first year of college. Had a 40-hour job, second shift, and I worked at Haynes Knitwear. Haynes Knitwear produces undershirts and briefs. We were constantly at Haynes Knitwear concerned that the 800 people who were sewing the piece of material to make the undershirt did it the most efficient way. And so we would do time studies at Haynes Knitwear on every movement and action that the sewer would do to create that brief. Because we were interested in getting out a quality product. Haynes Knitwear was not interested necessarily in growing, so they hired a lot of managers to make sure that every movement was perfect. Engineers were in the plant always. That's management. But as I've looked at the last 25 years and been in organizations associated with growth, I quickly found out that Growth and leadership is needed for this day because we are not in an industrial revolution anymore. If you don't think we still uh, pattern ourselves after an industrial revolution, think just a moment with me. Look at the schoolhouses. What do we do? We line up all the desks, just like the sewing machines were lined up at Haynes Knitwear. We do it a certain way. When in reality, Leadership is about creativity. Leadership's about growth. And leadership is about forward movement. And I'm going to make a statement right now that I hope gets your attention for the entire day. I hope you think about this. Leadership, leadership for growth can happen in any organization. Every church can grow. Every ministry can move forward. Despite the obstacles, despite all the issues that are around, you can grow. And I'm going to talk to you about that this morning. So let's, let's go forward just for a few moments and look at growing through community. One aspect of growth. So remember my definition of leadership. Leadership, for the purposes of this presentation, is about forward movement of an organization. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And he was healing every disease and sickness among the people. If you look later, we see when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. I love the life of Jesus Christ. That's what I modern try to pattern my life after. And as I look at his life, I love the book of Mark. Can you imagine that? I like actually Psalms 37, 37, Mark the perfect man. I really do like that verse. You guys still aren't awake, are you? That was a joke, okay? And uh, I love the life of Jesus, but I like the book of Mark. And here's a passage or a phrase that is used over and over in the book of Mark. Jesus being moved with compassion, 
being moved with compassion, fed the hungry, healed the sick, met needs. So, Dr. Smith, how do you grow an organization? It starts here. It starts here with compassion. Let's talk just for a few moments together. First of all, leadership growth must flow from a heart of compassion. You will never, ever, ever grow an organization in leadership without having compassion. So what's compassion? Compassion is seeing a need. But biblically speaking, it's much more than seeing a need. Compassion is doing something about the need. In fact, if you look at this word, let me give, give you just a couple of definitions. This word compassion, Jesus had compassion. This word compassion really means in the original language to care so much about something that you act to solve the need. Compassion is associated with bowels of mercy. Most people never take the time to really get into understanding what compassion is. Compassion is associated with the gut-wrenching feeling that you have when you see a need. When you drive by every morning, we go down to Shandon to church, a large uh, church in our community here runs uh, several hundred, a couple thousand at least. We go down on Sunday morning and where we go off the exit every single day on Sunday we see a group of guys standing out asking for help. I'm hungry. Would you help me? You can drive by them or you can have your gut wrench saying, wow, they're hungry. Oh, they're just in it for drugs. That's why they stand out there. You can see all four of them. They're at one corner, this corner, that corner. All corners are covered. They're just asking for money. And you can view them that way. Or you can do as my 93-year-old mother-in-law who rides every Sunday to church with us every single time she says honey do you have a dollar do you have something you could give them see i i'll make a bold declaration to you the reason most churches are not growing is because they've lost their compassion Amen. they don't understand what's what ministry is truly all about the reason churches grow is because your heart is consumed with the heart of Jesus Christ, which was moved with compassion. And authentic leadership in ministry always, always is about a heart of compassion. I've studied the life of Jesus. My first pastorate, I was 25 years old. I'd just become a senior pastor, and I... Uh, went into a community, a coal mining community. I was working on my doctorate in higher education administration. And that coal mining community was about 30 miles from West Virginia University where I was working on that doctorate. And that little town had been severely hit by the coal mines closing. Economically depressed, 40% unemployment. And a uh, a gentleman called me and said, would you pastor our church while you're doing your doctorate? And I said, you know, I, I would be willing to do that after prayer. Uh, my wife and I went. We went to that little community. And I drove into the church. The church had 25 people in it. So you know that I've not always been about thousands. 25 people, and we begin to pastor. Begin to go out and knock on doors in the community. And uh, let me say something to you, even in an information age, when you think it doesn't work, a house-going pastor still makes a church-going people. Amen. A house-going pastor still makes a church-going people. Amen. It works. You say, that doesn't work today. No, I, I, I've done it in the last week. It works. Okay? You go see people and invest and love them, and you give a heart of compassion, they're going to become associated with you and your church, and they're going to grow. 
you're going to grow as an organization. So I go in this community, and here is a man sitting on a porch, and I'm in my little Preston County Cadillac because we were 4,000 feet up in the mountains and averaged 200 feet or 200 inches of snow a year. We had a huge amount of snow, and so you had to have a Preston County Cadillac, which was a four-wheel drive in those mountain days. And I'm in my four-wheel drive, and I drive down the road, and the Holy Spirit just speaks to me and says, look at that man sitting at the little trailer. I was already passed since the Spirit speaking. I back up. I pull into his driveway. And there sits John Keller, six foot three, 275 pounds, huge man. I'm six foot, 180, used to be. That was football days, okay? I'm six foot, I'm about 180, literally at that time. And I'm a little bit intimidated, but the Holy Spirit said, stop, so I stopped. I drive into his driveway, and I go and say, Hi, I'm Mark Smith. I'm the new pastor at such and such church. He never says a word. But the Holy Spirit told me to be there. Okay? The Holy Spirit said stop. I sat there about 15 minutes and talked to him just to become his friend. and No response. I finally got in my truck, left, went to our Wednesday evening service. I said, I stopped at such and such a place. And two of my board members came to me and said, stop. Don't go back there. That's John Keller. He owns the two bars in town. He has beaten his children with two by fours. He ran off the last two preachers from there with a shotgun. Don't go back, Pastor. I said, men, the Holy Spirit said, stop. I have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. So I'm driving about a week later, and I sense the promptings of the Holy Spirit to stop. So I stop. And I talk to Mr. Keller. He never says a word. Fifteen minutes, I leave. I think, I need to pray with this man. I could see he was not in good health. My heart of compassion, the gut-wrenching was there. This man needs Jesus. And I feel like God has laid him on my heart, and I'm the one to lead him to Jesus. I must be faithful. And, I, and the Holy Spirit said, don't pray. Whoa. I've never been told not to pray, but I sensed it as clearly as ever. Don't pray. Okay. So I left. Third time, fourth time, fifth time. On the sixth time of going and stopping after about six weeks, I sensed a release in my spirit to say, it's okay. Go ahead and pray. And so I prayed with him. Just a short prayer. God, you see Mr. Keller. You see I'm trying to build a friendship with him. You see I love him. I just want you to take care of this man. I want to go to heaven with him, Lord. Just planting a few seeds, and I left. Sabbath time, I go back. Rejection's, rejection's hard in ministry. You know that. You've had it. And I go back, and he says, why do you keep coming? He spoke. And I said, Mr. Keller, because I love you. And I see you as a man that needs to know my Jesus. And he began to talk. He said, well, I'm 74 years old. You know what kind of man I am. He was the meanest man in our town. He said, you've heard all the stories. You've been here now a few months. He said, um, why would you be associated with me? And I came back and said, because I love you. And I want you to know my Jesus. 
And so that time I stayed about 30 minutes and he began to say, well, I have cancer. I've had a heart attack. In a few weeks, my leg has to come off from diabetes. I'm really in bad shape. And so that time I was able, through the heart of compassion, to say to him, Mr. Keller, would you mind if I pray for you? And let me tell you about this Jesus that I want you to know. Three minutes, four minutes. You know, I've been to every church growth seminar you, you can go to. You have as well. I've spoken them in them across the nation. And here's what I've learned about leading people to Jesus. Just tell them your story. Just tell them about your Jesus. It's the simplest way. We're talking about growing an organization. We're talking about growing an organization from a heart of compassion. And so we finished that time and I said, would you like to accept Jesus? And he, he was like, no, we're not there. And so I just backed off and I got in my truck and I left and went back the eighth time and went back the ninth time. And I was in Charleston, West Virginia for a ministry conference. As I was there, about three in the morning, I received a call. Come quick. You need to be at Preston Memorial Hospital. John Keller's in the hospital, and he's asking for you. And so I get in the car at three in the morning. I drove through the morning hours, and about 6 a.m., I arrive in Preston County, a, a small hospital, county hospital, and I walk into the room... And John Keller's there, and he's had a heart attack. And he's in a very weakened condition. And he looks at me, he says, Preacher, thank God you're here. I said, well, I'm glad to be here, Mr. Keller. What can I do from you, for, for you? And he said, Preacher, could I just take a moment and have you explain to me about that Jesus you talked about? He said, in fact, he said, some little guy came in, and this is not casting dispersions. This is his story, okay? He said, some little guy came in this morning, and he had a collar on. He said, like a black suit, and he was like reading me some rights or something. And he said, he was trying to prepare me for death. And he said, I concluded he didn't know what he was doing. So he said, I had to call for you. And I said, Mr. Keller, I said, let me tell you about Jesus. Ten times, heart of compassion, Holy Spirit speaking. And I was able to lead Mr. Keller to Jesus Christ in that hospital room. The meanest man in town led to Jesus Christ. As a young man, God placed a heart of compassion, a heart of love for people. And you can grow your organization if you will love people and have a heart of compassion so I prayed with him and he looked at me and he said I don't know anything about church but he said I've always heard you're supposed to be baptized I looked at Mr. Keller and I thought number one I can't baptize you <laughs> you're too large I could but number two you're never getting out of this hospital I knew it so I just went over to the water fountain excuse me all my Baptist friends, excuse me. <laughs> I went over to the water fountain and I just got a cup of water and I just poured it all over it. I don't know what the nurses thought. Didn't care what the nurses thought. I just poured water all over him. And he looked at me and raised his hands and said, praise God. I felt that from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. Jesus lives in my heart. He said, why are you telling us that story? Let me tell you what happened afterwards. That story began circulating around a little town. I was at a church. Debbie's here this morning. I was at a church, and Debbie and I would go and talk through the community, and every place we went, they would say, your church doesn't care about anyone. He had that reputation. That's why they were running 25. And that story began to spread, and bars were closed, and he said to me, go get my children that I've been so abusive to. He said, I want them to 
see dad like this. And I went and got his children and he asked his children to forgive him. Right there in the hospital bed. And God began to do a reunion. And God began to work. And I watched in that community from that experience. And he said to me, he said, I want everybody to know in my town that I'm saved. He said, go buy a billboard and put up that Johnny Keller got saved. And I did it. I did it. I've spent about $250 million in marketing in my lifetime. That's the best one I've ever done. I promise you. Okay? And so we are there. And what happened for the church was that wave of compassion began to spread. And for 26 straight Sundays, someone came to our altars and prayed through. That little church went from 25, I watched it go next year to 53, I watched it go the next year to 81, I watched it go the next year to 113, I watched us build a new sanctuary in a tiny little town, and we had 378 people on opening day. I know that's small in regards, but what I learned through that process was this, if you have a heart of compassion, a heart of love for your community, you can grow your organization. Here at CIU, it's been a great school. It's coming up on its 100th anniversary. But some people have said, what are we doing in the community? How are we growing? How's it sat here for so long and seen some st- just a le- level of stability? A wonderful, wonderful place. We are starting to love our community again. And that makes all the difference in the world when you love someone and have the heart of compassion. See, being moved so much that you take action to do something about the need. Do you have compassion? Leadership, secondly, should always be about community. It's about the place where you serve. I don't care how much missions you do. Listen to me. We're a mission school. 19,000 alumni in 150 countries. We're a mission-sending organization. But when I walked in and saw this organization, the wonderful organization that it is, I said, why is our community around us like it is? Why is there economic depression? Why is there poverty? Why are there people that don't have food? Why is there a high crime rate? Why is there prostitution? Why is there drunkenness? Why are there bars within a few feet of the school? Why, why, why? And I said to our school when I came, we're going to be about community. We're going to love the community first. I don't want a student leaving here and going to the mission field who doesn't know how to do it right here. Your church should love your community. I go out and speak. I had a pastor recently say this to me. I was appalled. He said this to me. He said, you know, our church has been about 100 for the last 15 years. We can't seem to get out of the ruts. But he said, we just don't see many needs around us. And driving in, I looked over and there's a porn shop. And over there is a prostitution place. And there's bars all around him. And there's people in his community so poor that they had nothing to eat. And I wanted to be like Jesus and say, open your eyes. The fields are white unto harvest. Pastor, minister, this is to encourage you. You can grow your organization if you learn to serve the community. Open your eyes to what Jesus has done Amen. right around you and has given you with regard to serving. Community, the word means to build up, to fortify, to serve, to meet needs. Last night, my son Micah, who's 16, were Debbie and I are trying to teach him character traits. Last night, our character trait we worked on was being a servant. And I went over the passage that he who is greatest among you must be servant of all. Minister, pastor, on a Monday morning, you probably shouldn't hear Dr. Smith say this. But if your week is not filled with serving 
others, you do not understand what ministry is about. Amen? It's about serving. I said to my son last night, I don't care how great you are. He has these aspirations because he can kick a 51-yard field goal in the 11th grade. And he, he's the kicker for Ben Lippin School over here, our school of about 1,000. He has these aspirations that he's going to do something great. I said, Micah, I don't care how great you are. If you don't serve, you miss what Jesus had to say. Pastor, I don't care how great you are. This job president, every morning, the prayer that I get up and pray is this. Lord, who can I serve today? Who can I help today? That's what, that's what ministers do. That's how we serve. And so if you look, organizations that grow are always focused on solving needs. There are needs all around you. Are you, are you meeting those needs? Are you moving forward to take care of what's right in your community? Let me give you a couple of for-profit organizations that learned about growth. You ever heard of Amazon? Did anybody buy Amazon stock when it was $1.48? Man, I wish I'd bought a lot of that, don't you? I have some. Uh, didn't buy enough. Uh, my wife is the queen of Amazon. You didn't know that? I mean, there's an Amazon guy at our house every day. I love you, honey. <laughs> Yesterday, my neighbor Ken and I were uh, talking. Ken's wife, Missy, is a, they're great neighbors. God gave them to us. We love them. And uh, we were talking and, and, and debating which, which, which one of them was the queen of Amazon, you know? I mean, the boxes just come regularly. My 16-year-old son, Micah, he came in the other day, and he has a great sense of humor, and Micah said to me, he said, Dad, Amazon called today. I said, what's going on? He said, they hadn't delivered a package in three days, and they wanted to check and see if Mom was dead or not. <laughs> I love you, honey. <laughs> I'm not getting brownie points, am I? <laughs> But what did Amazon do? What's Amazon do? At Christmas time, what's everyone do? Man, you don't have to go to the store. You don't have to do one thing but hit that button and it shows up. Amen? They met a need. What does Zoom do? Wow, last year, did you buy any Zoom stock? My 25-year-old son works in IT and he said to me, Dad, the first day, buy Zoom stock. I didn't. I wish I had. What did Zoom do? Be real honest, I hate it. I'm Zoomed out. Anybody else Zoomed out? I mean, every problem that you can imagine goes wrong in the Zoom meeting. And that's with a good IT staff around you. But Zoom, what did they do? They met a need. What do we do? Church, let me give you a few things we do. First of all, we introduce people to communion with Jesus Christ. We're meeting needs. The only reason your organization is not growing is because you haven't introduced them to communion. Communion with Jesus Christ and communion with the fellowship. This word community and communion all go one in one, uh, all go together. It's from the root word in Latin. That root word in Latin means to have interaction, to fellowship, to commune together. And first we have communion with Jesus Christ that we introduced him to. Do we have a world that needs Jesus today? Communion is needed. In a world that's socially isolated, do we need communion? We need communion. And it starts with Jesus Christ. We lead them to repent and be baptized in Jesus Christ. Secondly, we lead them to community and connection. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the num that number. And it's continued on and on and on and on because we connect, we commune, we daily are connecting to new people. Let me give you a little leadership lesson on growth. How do you grow an organization from 
1,100 to 2,200 in the last couple of years here at CIU. How do you grow an organization from 400 to 4,700? I'm going to give you one strategy that I use. God gave it to me a few years ago. Almost every day, if you were here, I connect with someone for lunch. Almost every month, I'm flying down to connect with Gerald Brooks at a ministry seminar, or I'm connecting with John Maxwell, who has been my mentor, personal mentor for the last 15 years. And John pours into my life and cuts the edges off that are sharp barbs and teaches me about leadership and about Christ. And deepens me. Or every month I am going to meet with Gordon Gee, the president of Ohio State, who mentored me for five years on how to be a college president. He's the number one college president in, in, in the nation, 62,000. Now he's back at West Virginia University. He's been at Brown University, was at Vanderbilt University. In the, in the academic world, he's considered the guru of presidents in higher ed. So when I heard that, I went after him. I saw him on a, on a flight in an airport. I said, uh, Dr. Gee, would you be my mentor? He said, I don't do that. But if you'll send me a letter, I'll think about it. And two weeks later, I got a letter saying, let me teach you. And if you remember, there was a man named Jim Trussell who was football coach at Ohio State. Jim's a dear friend. I was with him today. All the news broke. He wept as I was there with Jim. And I had connected to Jim, but then I got to go sit at the feet of Gordon Gee, and he handed me a 10-page document on all the mistakes he made as a leader, as president, in that situation that he shared with the board. To this day, I have that document. Guess what that did? It grew me as a president. So if you want to learn how to grow your organization in a community, I challenge you every day, go see the mayor, go see the town council, go see the county council, go see the business leaders. In this organization, the only way we've raised 30, 35 million in the last couple of years here at CIU is I knew I had to go and meet the business community. So on Friday, you would have been in my office, and I had been in Florida, and I met a couple who have a billionaire business. That billionaire business is stationed in Dallas, Texas. They are in Arizona, and I asked them for a gift of two to five millions. It didn't just happen. It's about connections. In your organization, if you really want to see leadership growth, you need to grow personally by mentoring, and a coach, and this is what I've challenged my team, every person must have a coach that is far advanced of where they are. You want to grow as a leader? Who's investing in your life? Get out of your comfort zone. Let someone take you to a new level. Dr. Gordon Gee looked at me when he was done after five years. He said, do you want a Big Ten presidency? You're ready. I said, no. God has called me to Christian ministry. And he said a few expletives and said, get that blank out of that type of ministry. They'll destroy you. That was his viewpoint. So after five years, I hadn't had much impact on him, you could tell. That was his view. But I was kingdom-minded. And I took his earthly wisdom and had him pour into me to where today CIU gets the benefits of all those mentors that have mentored me for the last 20 years. It's taught, called connection and community and pouring into. Dr. Benny Tate sits down here. He's one of my ministry connectors. He's connected me to more people than you would ever know. And we have this, let me, let me give you one little side point here. Don't ever be a taker when you have a mentor. Add value to them. 
be value added. Dr. Tate likes shoes. I love to send Dr. Tate shoes because he pours into my life. He gives to me. When Sonny Perdue, the Ag Secretary, was governor of Georgia, Dr. Tate took me to see Sonny Perdue and make a lifelong connection. And then Sonny Perdue came and spoke at our graduation. That didn't happen because of Mark Smith. That happened because of connection. In your community, you can build awareness of your church and your organization by connecting. And every single week, make it a high priority to connect with someone. You want to know Gerald Brooks? Gerald's going to connect you to everyone. That's why Gerald's here. You want to know Deion Sanders? This is the man who has pastored Deion Sanders and poured into his life. Connections. You want to lead your organization to growth? It's about community. It's about connections. Now let me give you a few things. When I came to CIU, I drove down Monticello Road and my heart was gut-wrenching. It was ripped. It was hurting. First time I said to my wife, why? Why in a primarily economically depressed African-American community is CIU not the leader in solving? And so here's what we did. There was a bar at the bottom of the, of the hill. Prostitution, Friday, Saturday nights. My wife and I would drive by. We'd see the prostitutes out. Our students couldn't even walk up and down the street. I asked for a meeting of the 50 or so people in the community organizations. I said, Why are, what's our number one issue? Everyone said crime. I asked Dr. Andre Melvin, one of the pastors who works here. I said, will you lead an effort? And I delegated and began to pour into him and love him. And I would go and be at the meetings. And we invested over $2 million in the corridor and we closed down the prostitution and the bar in our community so that our community today can start flourishing again. And now since then, here's what's happened. This is what we had, a bar. This is what's coming in. You think it'll have any difference, make any difference in this community? Already there's discussion of additional entrepreneurial businesses coming to the community. We had this as an area right down the road that was extremely uh, bad for this area. And so now we moved into the Richland County Sheriff's Department. We said to them, we have a building. We have no, no police presence. Would you come? So I met with the sheriff. I connected. And we started doing community work together. The sheriff here at the substation, when it opened, invited me down to begin to speak to the community and pour into the community. We started Hoops for Hope. We live in an area where all the students around here have very few outlets for athletics. Don't have your building sitting empty when you sit in the middle of a community that needs Jesus. All week long, use them. Most churches have a little one hour a week mass in their, sorry, in their facility, and I wonder how God's going to hold us accountable. So now we started who? 300 kids gave their hearts to Jesus Christ last summer in what our basketball coach started, Coach Tony Stockman. CIU basketball camps, Hoops for Hope. Coach Stockman played, as you know, at a high level. Ohio State, Clemson, player of the year in Ohio, at Ohio State. And so he has a lot of credibility. Here's that group. We live in the perhaps the worst reading scores in all of South Carolina. And we're a college. I wish every church could grasp this. I wish every organization could grasp this. And so I said to our team, our education departments, 
our basketball teams. Let's go every week and play basketball 30 minutes and read to them for 30 minutes. And so we have hundreds of students going to do reading and hoops for books. We started neighborhood cleanup. Let me go one back. Our students at CRU are being taught to be servants. They're so awesome. I love working with them. For those of you who think this generation's lost, don't tell me that. I believe in this generation. I will pour my life into this generation. And so they are out cleaning this community up. Why do you clean the community up? Because we want to attract business. We don't lift everyone in this area. Groceries were a need, and so our students, not the staff, not the faculty, 205 bags of groceries distributed by our missions teams here around Thanksgiving, just pouring into the community. Krispy Kreme Day, I was sitting in my office. It's almost Christmas time. My heart, my gut is wrenching. The compassion is flowing. What can I do? I want these students who will not have a great Christmas, some of them, to have a great Christmas. So I said to the team, go get 300 dozen donuts. Let's go give them out to students. It does help that the chairman of the board of Krispy Kreme Donuts sits on our board. That, that helps out as well. <laughs> don't, don't bring Dunkin' Donuts in here. <laughs> Only Krispy Kreme will do for us. And guess what happened this year? Did I as the leader and our team start out to say we want to get some award? No. Further thing from our mind, we decided to serve the community. And the way an organization grows is by having compassion that's so gut-wrenching, the bowels of mercy which flow from compassion that you start making a difference. It drives you to action. Could I ask you to do one thing for me? One thing for me from this session. Will you go back with your board or your elders or your deacons and not do the routine of going over the treasurer's report and looking at the financial status of your church because God never operates from that paradigm anyway. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God has the resources. So stop that. And I want you to go back, and this is what I challenge every church when I go out and speak to do. Every board meeting, set aside 30 minutes to think. Think. Metacognition. Thinking about what you're doing in serving your community. And just ask the question, what are our needs? Are we serving this community? If you do that, you'll grow. One pastor said to me when I was out recently, he said, I'm not going to ask any more divorced people to come to my church because they're too messy. <laughs> you think that didn't happen? I can give you a name. They're too messy. Didn't Jesus love the woman at the well? And how many husbands? They're too messy. When we have that kind of attitude, I can promise you we will not grow in our churches. And the only reason we're not growing in our churches, we haven't opened our eyes because the fields are widened to harvest in our communities and we don't see the needs. James McCall, great new leader we've hired here, had a potato drop. We took 40,000 pounds of over uh, a bag, uh, uh, unbagged potatoes. They said, we need to get rid of these. They're going to be destroyed. We need to get these through the community. In a few hours, we bagged 40,000 pounds of potatoes. Our students did. Love our students. And they got them out to the community. Wow. That's leadership in the community. And it grows your organization. I conclude. 
Leadership growth is about continuance. It's about community. It's about compassion. It's about community. It's about continuance. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Let me share something with you just a moment. In order to grow your organization, you must have two things that occur. First of all, growth, leadership growth, is always going to cause friction. Are you aware of that? Do you have some of those board members in your church or some of those leaders in your church that always say, we tried that before. We did that. We're not interested in that. We love just having us four or us 40 or us 400. Well, I always wondered in high school, I, in my senior year, I received the Physics Student of the Year Award. I was going to vet school at Virginia Tech's where I'd planned when God called me into ministry. I got this Physics of the Year Award, and I've always wondered in God's great scheme why he would give me an award like that, and then I never get to use it. Well, this weekend I figured out. I went back to the old physics notes and did a little research. When you start talking about leadership and growth, there's something called friction. Friction can be great or it can be not so great. But there's two kinds of friction you must have in order to see forward movement. The big mo is what we call it around here. If you want to see the big mo, first you've got to have static friction. Now, static friction is what you have when a tire connects with the pavement. If you don't have that connection, you will never, ever get forward movement. Now, that is the apostles' doctrine, the fellowship, the prayers, the baptism. That's what Acts 2 says is this whole idea of having Stability. Static friction is all about stability. So in your church organization, I hope all of you have achieved these. That's our goal. The church should be there. But then there's something else called kinetic friction. And kinetic friction refers to the movement or energy that moves an object. Not only do you need the apostles' doctrine, not only do you need fellowship and prayer, but this is the way I share with our team. Prayer should promote something within us that causes energy to flow, to go. Go ye, go ye, go ye. Static friction and kinetic friction. Kinetic friction or we might refer to as kinetic energy, is about forward movement. Think of a train. Think of an avalanche. When an avalanche starts, it may be a small snowball, but it explodes across the mountainside, taking out everything in its path so that it can accomplish the purpose of reaching its goal. And I have in my heart something that's welling up within me, that's saying, oh, that the dynamite power, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit would settle down upon us so that we could start seeing an avalanche of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ break forth across this place. May it start right here at CIU. May it start in your ministry. And may the Holy Spirit so flood you. Do you have a heart that's gripped, a gut that riches with compassion for those around you? You see community needs, and the glorious gospel goes forward for the cause of Jesus Christ. It's this. The big go, go ye, should bring the big mo. Amen? The momentum. It's my last illustration. Mark, why are you here at CIU? It's about the big mo and the big go. What, what brought you to this point? 
I'll tell you a story in closing. There was a little lady named Hallie Smith, who was my grandmother, whom God began to convict that she needed Jesus Christ. She was four foot eight, 90 pounds soaking wet. She never drove a car. We were from poverty. My grandmother had a Social Security check of $392 a month. In order to make ends meet, she would babysit children. Even up till she was 80, there would be four, five, six children in her home because it was her goal every year, no matter what, to hand every one of us 23 grandchildren a 50 or or $100 bill. Living on $392, that's tough. I had the benefit of mowing her yard. I didn't think it was a benefit in those days. But I would mow her yard every week, and I would get to go in, and Grandma would have me a bologna sandwich. I could still taste it. Hot, sweaty, glass of tea, or a Dr. Pepper, and a bologna sandwich. Grandma got saved, and she did a transformation in her life that was so drastic that my father who was scouted by the Brooklyn Dodgers at that time and was a fantastic baseball player, batted over 500 his senior season, was a catcher, and had the pros after him. He was, her change was so dramatic that my dad saw it. My dad got saved and started having that transformation in his life. And the story of family just all changed from living for the devil, from moonshine, uncle, granddad, for a fact, I know, didn't moonshine, on the hillside. I have distant cousins who still do it. The moonshine show you watch, it's pretty accurate. Okay. My uncle Lawrence, the moonshiner, got saved, came off the mountain, had been beating his wife, would fight with anyone, had been in, in, in cutting people. He carried knives. One of the mean, mean men in our community. Never learned to read or write, except he would, on Sunday mornings, get up. They had asked him to get up and read the scriptures, and he couldn't read or write. But for about five minutes on Sunday morning, the Holy Spirit would give him utterance till he would get up and read the Psalms and he would do like, oh, bless the Lord, all my soul, oh, my soul, and start crying and start, woo, shouting. And that's about all we ever got <laughs> because the joy of the Lord so flowed out of him. My grandmother passed away. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, getting ready to go on the TV program to speak. I flew back home to speak she had requested I speak at her funeral. I got in and I stood in line and here's this little lady who lived in the house and hardly ever got out. As I stood in line, I listened to this one go by and these four said, your grandma taught me about Jesus and I'm a Christian and I go to so-and-so church. And I'm standing there, and another one would come by. Your grandma taught me about Jesus, and I go to such and such church. And that evening, we counted a little lady who lived in her home, never got out, only made $392, over 200 children who were now grown adults who had been led to Jesus by my grandmother. Mark, why are you here? I have a mission to fulfill. You see, Grandma taught me about Jesus. Grandma changed the direction forever of our family for eternity. I want the big go 
to be all I live for so that the big mo, the momentum of a revival across our land breaks forth again. And at CIU, until I die, I will lead that way here, that the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And leadership is about growing and momentum and just loving with the bowels of mercy, the gut-wrenching bowels of mercy, that compassion that flows. Will you be challenged to have your heart broken? Will you be challenged with the message of it's time to lead? Father, I pray today for this group. May they be encouraged. Wow, what a lineup we have. I can't wait to hear the bishops. Can't wait to hear Dr. Tate, Dr. Brooks. I pray that your love and mercy will flow through this place. And may we have a thousand grandmothers raised up in this day to share the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray.